Thank you, Courtney. Beautiful way to begin our service this morning. Welcome to worship. We're glad that you could be with us at Trinity today. Uh, if you have your bulletin with you, I have a few announcements to go over. I'll start with today. Um, our preschoolers, uh, two through five-year-olds, are having their birthday party for Jesus. Uh, during. They had it during Sunday school, and they will continue through this service. Uh, so if you are uh, in that age group and you're going to Children's Church today, we will head down to the preschool hall, and pickup will be down there in room B108 today. Um, this afternoon, or af actually after this service, there is a lunch for our young adults. <laughs> they will be meeting at La Placida. If you want to get a ride or get together over here at the Oregon right after the service, they will be gathering there and then heading over. Uh, today is also the deadline on our affirmation stockings for our youth. Um, I put some lists of youth in the gathering area. If you would like to um, write a few notes to some of our youth, you've got this afternoon to, to get them in the stockings. They'll be picking them up tonight at their Christmas party. There is a tree uh, I wanted to tell you about in the gathering area. It's a special tree. Our RHGAs and mission friends have made homemade ornaments and they are all over the tree, decorating the tree and on little wires uh, hanging up. And those are for our global missions offering. So if you would like to donate three to five dollars per uh, ornament, that would be great. Uh, you can take them off the wires, you can take them off the tree. I know that probably goes against you right now to take things off of the tree at this point, but that is the goal for us to empty that tree and have lots of donations uh, to our global missions offering. And we appreciate our missions groups uh, doing that and making that visual for us this year. This afternoon, we have rehearsal at 4 o'clock for those who are involved in our youth Christmas music. It's called Christmas Unwrapped. It will be here in the sanctuary at 6 o'clock. Hope you can make that. It's always a fun time. And then afterwards, they have their Christmas party in the, the youth room. Tomorrow night, our young adult Bible study meets. This will be at 6.30 in the youth room, and it's the last meeting for uh, the fall. And then they will begin back in January. And then Wednesday night, we have um, supper again. It's our missions fundraiser, though, for the uh, Dominican Republic trip that will be coming up in 2018. But we're grilling out. We'll have hamburgers and hot dogs. That will be something different this time of year. Uh, French fries, baked beans, brown. So um, a full supper there, and then afterwards, uh, we will not have our usual prayer meeting, but if you would like to go caroling, our youth are going to Madison Village, and then everyone else can either go to Madison Village or to Merrill Gardens, which is a new place for us uh, this year. So there'll be no missions groups but uh, meeting, but you'll uh, have opportunity if you would like to go as a family. We will organize that after the dinner on uh, Wednesday night about 6 o'clock. And then next Sunday uh, is December 17th. We will have lessons and carols, and that will be in both of our, our morning services. And then that evening, we have child care here at Trinity for those adult classes who want to have their Christmas parties. And that will be from 5 to 8. Pizza supper is included for the kids. Um, so just make a note of that for next Sunday. Uh, please stand now for the passing of the peace.
This is the second Sunday of Advent, and I've had a, a, a great time reading devotionals by you guys in uh, our our congregation, the devotional guide that we have. But I've also been um, picking up some other devotionals here and there, and I heard one online this week, and a guy was sharing a story about when he was three years old, which I thought was amazing. But he said he remembers he was at church with his mom, and it was Christmas because... It was decorated. They had the greenery and lights and a manger scene. And he said the church was crowded also and that he heard a baby cry. So he turned to his mom and he said, is that baby Jesus? And she said, she, she hesitated, but she said, yes, it is. And he talked about how he still believes that. Not in the three-year-old literal sense, but in the sense that he still believes that Jesus comes to us. A simple child with a simple message, but into a complicated world. And I'm especially reminded of this story as our preschoolers are celebrating their birthday party for Jesus today. You never know what they will remember or what they will teach us. Welcome to worship. Let us now sing together our hymn of Advent, hymn number 77, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Please stand as we sing together. seated. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 11 verses 6 through 9. In that day the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with a lion and a little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put, put its hand in a nest of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. Please pray with me. Lord, please be with us, our families, and our community in the coming weeks as we prepare to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
For this time in our service, every week we offer a chance for you to be still and know in the midst of this often frantic and hectic season. We ask that you take a moment of quiet and stillness here as we move through this hour of worship together. So please now take a moment of quiet and stillness and prayer. God, on the second Sunday of Advent, we do pray for your peace. We ask for your peace in a world torn apart by strife, and division, and violence. We ask for your peace for those moving into the holiday season, facing loss, facing pain, facing loneliness. We ask for your peace to fill us Fill us to overflowing that we may take it out into the world, being the bearers of your image, your name, and making your peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, our pre-K and our kindergartners are invited to exit for the birthday party for Jesus, which is in not the usual spot. It is in B108, down on the preschool hall. As we stand and sing our hymn of devotion, hymn number 88, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, please stand as we sing together. seated. 
This morning's scripture is Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. It's commonly referred to as the Valley of Dry Bones. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into this, these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and breath entered them, and they came to life, and stood up on their feet, a vast army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. And they say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I am the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Today we're highlighting the CBF field personnel, Jessica and Josh Hearn, who are serving in Danville, Virginia. Danville has been described as a city of churches. Jessica and Josh direct a group named Grace in Maine. One of the primary ministries of Grace in Maine is a community garden. Sadly, the area around Grace in Maine has been described as a food desert. This is an area without a grocery store within walking distance for people to purchase fresh food. Grace in Maine received a donation of unused land from Habitat for Humanity. Then they collaborated with their neighbors to plan and develop this land into an urban farm. They asked their neighbors which fruits and vegetables they preferred. This led to more conversations and relationships that grew, just like the garden. Jessica and Josh Hearn and all the CBF field personnel depend on the Christmas Global Missions offering for their salaries, benefits, and housing costs in order to continue their work. This offering goes directly to help fund these necessities. In the pew racks right now are the CBF and Lottie Moon offering envelopes and they'll be available all month. So let's take a moment and pray silently for the ministry of the Hearns and how best we can support our missionaries. <coughs> Amen.
Good morning. Thank you for being with us in church today. I know it's very cold outside, but uh, hopefully you're warm in here with our church family. Uh, I wanted to mention uh, one thing before I begin the sermon today. I wanted to uh, thank you all for your prayers and thoughts for Mary and, and uh, her family during the passing of her dad this week. And it means a lot to us. And uh, we're very thankful and blessed to have you uh, as our church family to journey with us through good times and hard, hard, uh, sorrowful times as well. So thank you so much for that support. And then I also wanted to mention tonight a very special thing. Our youth will be presenting their Christmas program for us at 6 o'clock. And uh, we, we're, we're very blessed to have these young people who put a lot of time and effort in presenting these programs for us. And I know it means a lot to them. If you can take the time to be here tonight at 6 and support them and learn and listen and be blessed by the ways God will work through them uh, as they present sort of the Christmas story for us in, in their own way. Uh, they're going to be practicing at 4 o'clock today, getting ready, and so they put a lot of effort into it. And we talk a lot about sticky faith here in our church, which is the importance of intergenerational relationships. And for you to be here uh, and for them to see that you're supporting them as your uh, church's youth, it means the world to them. So I hope that you'll be able to come out tonight uh, and be blessed. And we're excited about whatever it is you're going to present for us tonight. I know it's going to be great. In 1928, the uh, famous Myers family Jubilee Singers sang a song and recorded uh, a song by uh, a man uh, who wrote about this scripture story that Glenn read for us earlier, The Valley of Dry Bones. Uh, the name of the song is an old spiritual. It's called Dim Bones. Dim Bones. Have any of you ever heard that song? You remember Dim Bones? Uh, it was about a series of bones based on this story that would somehow, with God's help, come together and be connected and that each bone should listen to the word of the Lord, the word that the prophet would preach to each of the bones, no matter how great or small they were. Here's some of the lyrics to the song. Toe bone connected to the foot bone. Foot bone connected to the heel bone. Y'all know this? Heel bone connected to the ankle bone. Ankle bone connected to the leg bone. And it goes on, and periodically the refrain would be interrupted with these words, Now hear the word of the Lord. And then it would go on and on and name the bones all the way to the top of the head. And it would add into these words as well, Dim bones, dim bones, going to walk around. Dim bones, dim bones, going to rise again. Now hear the word of the Lord. Our story in Ezekiel is written for people who are lost. They are in exile. They are displaced. They are away from the source of their faith in Israel and their home. They are in a farm place. And their faith is running low. Their hope is lacking. They feel like they have no hope. They have a crisis of hope. Now, I, I told the early service that sometimes when we preachers get together, we talk about different things. And one of the things that's sort of a joke uh, in my little generation is that one of us one day is going to be riding along in the country somewhere, and we're going to find a little church called No Hope Baptist Number 2. I, I don't know why that's a thing for us, but there's got to be a No Hope Baptist number two. And I was telling a group, we were talking about that one time a couple of years ago, and somebody says, I've actually seen a Little Hope Baptist church. Have you ever seen a Little Hope <laughs> church? So that's better than No Hope for sure. And if you ever ride through the countryside, I've been doing a lot of that this week, the signs that some of these little churches can have are pretty fascinating to me. <laughs> It's very plain, contextual, the way they present their message. Here's a couple that I saw this week that I thought were pretty interesting. One of them in the season of fall says, Fall for Jesus, He never leaves. Okay? <laughs> and underneath it were these words, exact words, The Bellamy Sisters is having a program Sunday night. I don't know who the Bellamy Sisters are, but they, they're, they're going to have a program. And I know it's going to be good. Another one I saw said, Seasons change, but God never will. I like that one. And underneath it said, hot dog and bake sale tonight. <laughs> now, now that's very real church life right there, isn't it? The message and we got to do a fundraiser. And then the one I saw yesterday on the way over here in the context of this movie season, long ago in a Galilee far, far away. <laughs> so you never know what you're going to see. So the people in exile, I think, were feeling like they were members of Little Hope Church or maybe No Hope Church. And into the context of that, 
This prophet Ezekiel receives a vision from God where God places him in a valley of dry bones and finds this miraculous work that those bones that everybody thought had no hope could actually, with God's help, come to life and live. Now these bones have no hope. And that is important to note in the story. They're whitewashed bones. They are dry bones. They are brittle bones. And there's a lot of them. Every human body has about 200 or more bones in them. So just imagine this pile of bones everywhere. And the Bible says that God led Ezekiel through the bones. He didn't just sort of go on the outside or up on a hill and look down over them. It actually says in the Hebrew, He led them thoroughly through the bones to see each one, great and small. And I think part of the reason it tells us that is that Ezekiel is going to share this vision with his people and remind them that you do not belong to a no hope church. You belong to a big hope family of God. Now there's people that from time to time that can act like they live with no hope or they behave like they have a little hope. But the reality is we all belong to a God of big hope. And that is Ezekiel's story for his people who feel disconnected from God. In verse 1, he says, God set him down in this valley. He didn't necessarily choose to go to that valley of dry bones, but God set him down in that valley. And that's important to note. When my uh, time at seminary ended, it was time for me to, to get out into the real world. My first church, you know, we just, I was brand new at all this, didn't know how to deal with a search committee, didn't know how to do any of it. And we were led to go to this church in North Tennessee, and the search committee invited us down, Mary and me and our little baby Andrew at the time. And we were looking around the town. And one of the stops we made was in the house that the church owned, the preacher would live in, the parsonage they called it. And it should have been sort of a red flag for us that they couldn't find a key to get into the house. And we didn't, we didn't know what we were doing. And so they broke in to the, the parsonage. <laughs> And we saw all that wood, old wood paneling, and Mary said, you know, what do we got to paint that? And it was a little run down, but nobody in the search committee had been in the preacher's house, the church's house, in a long time. Should have been sort of a red flag for us. And then another one was, when I preached my first sermon, I made a side comment, and my comment was, there should be no power brokers in God's church. Because it's Jesus' church, right? Everybody's equal. Everybody has an important voice. And it was a side comment. And after it was over, the chair of the search committee came up and he said, that was great. That's just what we needed to hear. And I was like, why is that just what we needed to hear? You know, and, and I, I remember thinking they never talked about their former pastor or anything. I knew in the past they had had John Claypool, one of the great preachers, I think, of all time. They also had Kevin Ezell, who is now currently the head of the North American Mission Board for the SBC. So I knew they had some very distinguished pastors in the past, but they didn't talk about it. Well, here's what happened. Uh, and Mary and I, we didn't know to ask at the time, but the, they had, there had been a search committee before us, and they brought before the church uh, a candidate to be the pastor of the church, who ironically was from my same hometown, from Hoax Bluff. Isn't that amazing? And for the first time in the church's history, they voted no, not to call the guy. And the search committee was devastated. It was turmoil in the church. And the church was so upset about it, they asked the search committee, try again. So they did. And they got a guy from Texas who came. And people told me later on, he was worse than the first. <laughs> but out of sympathy for the search committee, they went ahead. And, I hope y'all did. I don't know if I'm second or third when y'all brought me. <laughs> I just saw one of our former, former search committee members look around and laugh. So... <laughs> Mark, we got to talk. I didn't ask you those questions. <laughs> so, and this guy that came stayed nine months. And he actually left literally in the night. And I don't know if he put his Christmas tree out on the front of his house like Jimbo Fisher did when he left for Texas A&M. But that happened to him. And, and so we got there and what we found was the church was hurting. 
They were divided. They were really hurting. And it took, really, I'd say about two years to begin to process and work through all that. And many times in those two years, believe me, I was asking God, why? Why set me down my first church out of seminary? I'm just a young guy, inexperienced. Why set me there? And I remember very distinctly God speaking to my heart, somebody has to go into the valley. Somebody's got to do it. Why not you? The hardest visit I ever made as a pastor, which is some good friends of mine whose 16-year-old son was killed in a car wreck. And I walked up praying about what I would say when I went into their house. And I remember uh, before I knocked, hearing them in their grief inside. You could hear them. And I know to this day what the definition of wailing is. And I'll tell you that story to say somebody has to knock on the door. Somebody has to walk in the valley of dry bones. Somebody's got to go visit the hospital. Somebody has to go sit with a grieving man or woman whose life has been torn by a relationship. Somebody has to do those things. Somebody has to go. And God from time to time will set you or me down in somebody else's valley of dry bones. And God will do that because God loves us all. And when we see someone, a child of God, grieving like that, God will often send someone like you to sit down in the valley of dry bones with them, to minister to them. Isaiah said, I prophesied, but he didn't really have to. God could have on his own accord, God could have got those bones put together breathed wind into them, the spirit of life, brought the sinews and the connecting tendons and the muscles and the skin. God could have done all that by Himself, but God chose to use Isaiah to prophesy and speak to bones both large and small, just like God still uses you and me today. God uses us, God chooses to use us to go and witness the pain and the hurts, and to witness the healing, and to speak a word from the Lord. Now hear the word from the Lord. Sometimes you're going to be set down in the valley of dry bones, and you will be the friend that a person who's been in there a long time has been praying for, longing for the company of someone to simply sit beside them. Sometimes you're going to be that person. You'll have been in the valley for a long time and you'll have been praying for the company and one of your friends whom God has set down in your valley will come and be there and sit beside you. I hope you know that feeling. I have a feeling a lot of us have been in the valley and we know what it's like to receive the comfort. Hopefully we also know what it's like to give the comfort. So if you're in a valley of dry bones today, maybe one of the things you could do is ask God, why am I here? Do you have a use for me here? Is there somebody here that you want to bless, comfort, help through me? What is the purpose of this? Christianity is not a hobby. It's work. It's a lot of work. It's sacred work. It's good work. But it is very difficult work. The Bible says Ezekiel was shown through the bones thoroughly. And it's not just so he could later on say, what a miracle. He does do that but also to see what an enormous work God has called us to do. God has called us to this holy, special work, and it is tremendous. And it is not for lazy people. It is for people willing to commit a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of prayer, a lot of hope that endures, and to stick beside people who sometimes will have to be in the valley for long, long periods of time. It's hard to be one of God's kingdom's workers if you're a spectator. It takes work. There's much to do. Jesus once said, the fields are like white to harvest, but where are the labors? The labors are few, and we need labors because the work is so big. One time he's by the Sea of Galilee teaching and preaching, and there's a multitude of people there, and his disciples come and say, they are all hungry. And Jesus looks at them and sees that and says, don't send them home. Have them sit down in the green grass and I will feed them. And he takes what little is there and multiplies it for them. In Acts, 
The apostles hear a, a vision of a man in Macedonia saying, Come to us and send the light. I do know this. Most of the miracles we will get to experience in this world will happen in the valley of dry bones. And if you avoid the valley, if you're not ever going to step into the valley, you will most likely miss some of the most magnificent work of God in the world. Now, hear this. If you're in your valley of dry bones now, waiting for that friend of God to come to you, remember a word, a name, that we'll be talking a lot about around Christmas, and you'll hear a lot. It's called Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. It doesn't mean God with us when things are going great. It doesn't mean just God with us when we're feeling fine. It means Emmanuel, God with us all the time, in any circumstance, in any situation that we face. This God we have is the God who does not avoid valleys of dry bones. Soon we'll be singing, O little town of Bethlehem, in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. Our God does not avoid the darkest places of our world. In Philippians, the early Christians were singing a hymn and says, Jesus did not hold on and grasp the glory that He had in heaven before He came here, but He humbled Himself, emptied Himself, and became born as a human just like you and me. In the dark streets shineth the everlasting light. If you're in the valley, remember that God is in your valley too. God is Emmanuel all the time for any little bone or big bone that lies there. In verse 3, Ezekiel hears God ask him a question. And the question is, can these bones live? And Ezekiel does one of the greatest things, one of the greatest acts of faith that you'll ever see. He says, you God know. You know. What he's doing is deferring to God. What a great act of faith. So often we fail to defer to God. We make proclamations, decisions, judgments. This situation, this person, my life, this is what it is. Without deferring to God, God can do more than we can do, sees more than we can see, is able in ways that we could never be able. I remember, and you might remember, when, when the uh, first people went into outer space, they took a picture of Earth. Have you ever seen that picture? When that first came out, it, was, it had a profound impact on the people of Earth. With all our problems and our strife that we continue to have today, it was a view of Earth that we had never seen before. This blue, beautiful planet, a ball created by God, floating in this vast space. I saw, I thought about that, this picture. I follow a lot of Twitter feeds, and some from NASA, and one is from the International Space Station. And the ISS took some pictures this week, and one of them was Bangkok, Thailand, at night. And it was all lit up with the lights of the city. It was pretty fascinating to see that. But the thing that they were pointing us to were the many fishing boats in the harbor. And there must have been thousands of little dots of light out there. And it was fascinating to me to see that picture. I know this, God sees in a perspective that oftentimes we cannot see, particularly if we're the ones in the valley of the dry bones. God sees more than we can see. We get the sliver of the moment. Maybe in our tears or our pain or our despair or our feeling like we're members of Little Hope or No Hope Baptist Church, God sees much more than that. And God has asked us to trust God as we live through the valley until we come to the other side. John Claypool, the preacher I mentioned to you earlier, said after his daughter passed away from leukemia, sometime later as he was processing it, he said to his church, I don't know enough to despair. I don't know enough. God knows much more than what we know in the moment. Part of that means that you and I, from time to time, will have to refocus our hope. Refocus our hope. When I was younger, our little church, Briarwood Hills, had an RA basketball team. 
We had the black uniforms, just like the Spurs had. It was cool. I'd never seen any other team beside the Spurs have those black uniforms. And my coach, our coach, who's a member of the church, was a great guy. But he had a lot of friends who were junior high basketball coaches in schools. Now, I just got to tell you, those teams, were, they had players who were a little better than our RA basketball team. And he would schedule these games, these practice games with these junior high teams. And we played one team, and, and I'll just go ahead and tell you, the final score was them 70, us 11. It, it was bad. And so during the game, the Broward Hills RA basketball team had to refocus our hope. Now, we came in there thinking, hey, we want to try to win this game. But when it got to be 50 to 5, you know, we had to refocus our hope. And our refocus was double digits. <laughs> we wanted to get double digits. And I can tell you, when we get to that 11, when that guy hits that basket for 11, you would have thought we had won the NCAA championship. <laughs> we refocused. And sort of what that's going to mean for you and me in our world and our daily living is from time to time, we're going to have to refocus. Sometimes we put so much hope in our efforts and we get the sliver that we've got to refocus our hopes on the things that God can do and will do in us. That's what Ezekiel's doing. He's deferring to God. It doesn't mean that Ezekiel said, I know these bones are going to live. Or even that you will make these bones live. He just says, I'm going to have trust in you. I'm going to defer to you to see me through it, to raise them up, or to help me thoroughly work my process of grief through all of these bones until the end of time. Lord, you know is one of the great statements of faith in a God who's been there for us in the past. And so we can hope and expect that that same God will be there for us in the future. Deferring to God has a way of raising our hopes and people who have high hopes tend to look at the circumstances of their life and have more optimism and they believe that they can succeed. People who lack hope tend to look at the circumstances of their life and they find reasons for why they will fail. So listen to Ezekiel as God walks him thoroughly through the bones. They're talking about hope in a valley of dry, whitewashed, brittle bones. They're talking about graves that will open up and humans will rise and live through them. They're talking about people who are empty, who are dispirited, displaced, disillusioned, thriving, living again. Now this is a story that we get two Sundays before Christmas Eve. And part of the reason is it desentimentalizes Christmas for us. And sometimes we need that. Because so much of the world we live, I love what Teresa said in her invitation to worship, a simple message in a complicated world. I love that. We live in a complicated world, a complicated life that sometimes is very difficult for us to navigate. To desentimentalize that says it's okay to recognize and to name the pain, to name your valley. But the hope says you can speak to your pain, you can speak to your valley and say yours is not the only story to be told. This is not wishful thinking. This is relying on the promises of a God who says I will be faithful to you from generation to generation, from everlasting to everlasting. I've been told that Ted Williams, one of the greatest baseball hitters of all time, had such good eyesight that when the pitcher pitched the ball, he could see how the laces were turning. He could determine the kind of pitch. He could also read Spalding on the baseball. I don't know if he could or not. That's what I've been told. You've often heard it said, keep your eyes on the ball. At Christmas Eve, a little simple message I'm going to have is this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And if you're in the valley, whether you've been set down there to help someone else, or you found yourself cast down there, turn your eyes upon Jesus. This week, we spent some time in the hospital in the last hours of Mary's dad's life. And 
and just such a wonderful man. Called to preach at age 20. Married to Venice for 56 years. Um, it was not easy. The last night, Mary and I talked about sharing the story. The last night, there were four of us in that room. Mary's sister, her mama, Mary, and me. And I went and had them drag in another chair for me. And they brought in this chair that, you know, you're supposed to be able to recline back and sleep in it. Now, who can ever really sleep in a hospital room? But you're supposed to be able to do that. I got a new one. At first, I thought, I got a new one. But then I realized you would push it back, and it wanted to push you back up. It wasn't broken in yet. So I'd, I'd lean back that, that back, and then it would just do that constantly. And every time it was that, that sort of whatever material, it would squeak. It was just a constant squeak, and I was trying to be so quiet. And so I finally figured out with my heavy body, I could lean up more toward the back, the top of it, and I could just push it down with the gravity of my weight. But as I fall asleep, I'd slide down that slick stuff. And so it would just keep raising me up. And it was the craziest thing. And honestly, we laughed about it. We cried through the night. We were laughing. It was just, and we talked about a God that, that God sent His Son, Jesus, into a world where people have to sit in squeaky chairs from time to time. It does. And God does not avoid that place. God doesn't avoid the valley, doesn't avoid the dark, doesn't avoid the grief. God comes in to all of that. And that Jesus is the one that God raised to life. So we could say by the bedside, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. And if it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go there to prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. And we were crying and we were saying, mm-hmm, at the same time. Our God does not avoid the valleys. And sometimes God will send you and set you down in the valley of dry bones to do God's work, to witness the pain and the hurting, and to also witness to the power of God's healing. And in the valley, we're often asked to simply defer to God, to trust Him, and to listen to His Word. Because we don't belong to Little Hope Church. We don't belong to No Hope Church. We belong to a big hope family of God. And them bones are going to walk around. Them bones are going to rise again. Them bones, them bones, them dry bones. Now hear the word of the Lord. Amen. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also, I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship. We value community and global missions. And there are programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church, and I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, we'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by, and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity, and God bless you and keep you.